one thing that I want to call out is that if you are rewarding an action in a game with value, could be tokens, could be NFTs, and that value and that action could be repeated in mass, for example, the value of that reward will fall to the level of difficulty of that action. And if that action, say, is relatively easy or repeatable, then the fundamental value of that action approaches zero in the long run. And I think that's an important thing to consider with crypto games is if you're creating an action that is giving, say, token value, but that action is easily repeatable by a lot of people, then the value of that action falls towards zero, which means your token is going towards zero. Podcast. Welcome to the Deus Ex Style Podcast. I'm your host Kepler, and today I'm joined by Nick uh, to talk about token design, especially in the context of gaming. Um, so our goal is to talk about the token design process, then the general principles of token design, the challenges, and lastly, like how to become an actual token designer. Um, and Nick and is how to make good guest. tokens. We're going to make some good exactly. tokens today. Yeah. <laughs> Good tokens for once. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Nick is the perfect guest because he's working as a token advisor, so a venture partner in my capital. You actually have a background in board games, which is interesting because yeah, we talked about it before, but you're really deep into like emotions and uh having different perspective on like user behavior, player behavior. Um so yeah, maybe we can start with that, like your background in board games and yeah, how how did you end up doing token design? Yeah, so um, my my history has been in games literally my whole life. Um, it's pretty much the only thing I've done uh, in my life, and I've been doing it since the age of four. So it's it's been a lifelong passion of mine, um, and it turned into a profession, which was just an incredible opportunity. Um, and one of the things that I really love about games is it allows you to understand the human experience more deeply. Um, but it allows you to do it in a safe space where there's um, opportunity to fail without real consequence. Um, obviously, that's a little bit different with uh, with crypto because there's actual um, value involved. Um, but my my start was really built on the idea that you can do iterative testing uh, very very quickly, and you can see how human beings change their behavior or decisions or thought processes based on the rule sets that they're put in. Um, and I found this really fascinating. So. I got my start uh, designing puppet video games when I was four. Uh, I played the 8-bit Mario, um, and I loved it. And I had ideas on how to make the levels better. And better in that time was making more of what I wanted. So um, I, I drew out like huge levels on pieces of paper, handed my parents a cardboard controller, and I moved a puppet Mario across the screen with my finger um, as they shouted out A and B. Um, <laughs> I, I moved into board games shortly after that. Um, started making card games when I was six and, and seven, and I didn't have a ton of people to play test with, so I ended up play testing against myself. And through that process of playing against myself regularly, it was really interesting because I knew all of what the opponent was going to do uh, because it was me. <laughs> um, and so I was able to ramp up my strategy really, really quickly. And through this process, I was able to start imagining how the other player might be thinking. Um, you know, just from a deterministic standpoint, like a logic standpoint. And that helped me design really clean rules because I was able to find, you know, workarounds to the rules to find, you know, a, a better shortcut, a more optimal path, for example. And if that didn't match the experience that I was trying to create, I would design a rule to block it. Um, that really kept coming to fruition when I made a 450 of my own trading card series, uh, a la Pokemon. I was really inspired by that. Um, it was a Pokemon master back in the day. Uh, I was super into video games, played a lot of Zelda, played a lot of RPGs, um, a lot of Mario platformers. Um, yeah, I, I got into a lot of different stuff. 
Um, I used to, my, my parents only allowed me 30 minutes of screen time a day because they thought it was um, going to hamper my development. So I used to wake up every morning uh, at about 3 a.m. and I would play video games for two and a half hours before my parents would come wake me up for school. So I, I had to get the gaming in. It was very, uh, it was crucial for me. Um, but yeah, I, I went into board games, but I also went into party games. I was running amazing races in my neighborhood for kids for upwards of 200 people, simultaneous action. Um, and I was so logical about it that I designed the race in such a way that it would run automatically. So I would spend these parties literally sitting back in a chair, not doing anything and watching the race run itself. Um, so that was a really big you know, inspiration for me as well. Um, going into college, I really wanted to um, take my skills to the next level. And I had fallen in love with Survivor, uh, the TV show. And I really wanted to work on it. It was a, a dream of mine. And uh, long story short, I ended up walking up to Mark Burnett, who was the CEO basically of the show, and asked him for a job cold. <laughs> I was super lucky. Uh, I got to work in the Philippines for four months, building, painting, and testing all the challenges on the show. So I worked in reality television as a, as a challenge designer. Um, something that I picked up that was really interesting there is you always have to pay attention to who the real audience is. And you think you might be making the challenge for the contestants, but really you're making it for the people that are watching back home. Um, naturally, you're considering things like safety for the contestants because everybody's living on 100 calories a day. Um, but it's just a different mindset that you're thinking in. You're thinking about camera angles. You're thinking about the setup. You're thinking about how long it might take to set up one of these challenges. And another piece, yeah, I know I'm going to going on a bit of a monologue here, but another piece that I picked up from reality television is that um, in a lot of life, you try to make things more efficient. And the more efficient you get, the usually the more profitable, more scalable things become. But in game design and in challenges design, for example, you're intentionally making things inefficient. And that's what creates the fun, is the inefficiency. Because you have to try to discover what is the most effective way or optimal way to get past that inefficiency. And it makes you feel smart when you do so. That aha moment, that smartness, is really the, the addiction that keeps you going, that keeps you excited about the game. Um, and that really led into escape room design. Um, so I did a couple of escape room design. I did a lot of puzzles, physical puzzles. Um, so I designed like little knickknacks and things like that, ways to move your arms, move your hands. Um, trying to communicate with your partner who is across the room who can't see you, but if you can communicate effectively, you can solve the puzzle faster. Um, things like that. So really playing with physical space and understanding of how humans can interact and cooperate. And it, eventually the, the through line with all of this stuff is, is a deep understanding of emotion. And this really came to a head when I was in board games. Um, so I've been... Uh, I, I was a board game designer professionally for seven years. I put out 35 board games in those seven years, and I worked with every major entertainment licensor, um, including Disney, Marvel, uh, Harry Potter, um, Netflix, Amazon. Uh, and then my biggest hit was Jumanji, so the, the newest version of the game Jumanji uh, that's in stores now. It's worldwide. Um, and one of the big things that I picked up with board games was the full analysis of emotion. And one of the things that you do when you're considering designing a board game, because there's no interactive media, because the players themselves have to create the experience from literally just pieces of paper and cardboard, um, you, you have to have a deep understanding of how those human beings are going to interact with each other um, and play with the thing. And so when you're writing rules, for example, you almost want to leave some so that players can come up with their own house rules. Or get into an argument about you know, what might be the right path. And you can write it in such a way that there is a right path. But it's still open to a little bit of interpretation. So that when players create their house rules, they feel a sense of autonomy and ownership over the experience. And then they make it their own. Um, so I, I just found a, a lot of really interesting pieces in all of these different types of games. And so when I say I'm a game designer... I don't really focus on one medium. I focus on the experience of game design and the idea that you are designing for repeatable emotions that you might want to experience over and over again. Um, and so that tied really nicely into crypto. So I'll stop there and uh, knock it back. 
<laughs> yeah, nice. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into some of it. Um, mm. So one thing you mentioned on Survivor was that you're building the game the, or the challenges for the audience and not necessarily for the contestants. And I think that's also something that is changing a little bit in game design with like Twitch and streaming being this big, right? You also okay. have to more end because it's basically the new reality TV <laughs> in a way, right? You have like personalities that play a game. So you want to invoke certain emotions within the, the streamer that they build a good stream that other people like see their personality. And I feel like, yeah, there's like a parallel here. And also when you said uh, inefficiencies, I think that there's examples of that in, in gameplay as well, also like in economy. So for example, if you have a trading system and you have different trading posts and you have travel time between these, then of course you will have arbitrage opportunities. So some mm -hmm. people like there, they can earn money by being this arbitrage trader. Right. And um, so it, it opens up basically new dimensions of e economic gameplay, for example, or, or also if you. Yeah, like, let's 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 touch on yeah. that, actually, because, you know, some of the most fun trading in games happened when you are bartering because you have the ability yeah. to feel like you're getting a deal. Right. And you and the other person are coming to that that deal autonomously um, because you both find it interesting. And I find that some of the best trading experiences happen when there's no centralized medium of exchange. And I'm not talking like mm -hmm. a decentralized, centralized type of difference here. I'm talking about like currency, right? The most fun bartering happens when you're trading lamb for wool, right? And there's no, there's no dollar in between. There's no central, you know, exchange. However, it's funny because the most effective, most efficient, most market, you know, ready is to have some type of central medium of exchange. So, it's um, the, there's a bit of a, a clash there. If you want to make something really fun, you make it more inefficient so that, you know, you can still give autonomy to the players. But when you make something super efficient, when you have something with a medium of exchange, for example, with automatically updating prices with oracles and all these things, you're making it so efficient that it's almost transaction. Yeah, I guess if you if you do it this efficiently, it's it's like not part of the gameplay, right? It's more part of it's just well, there for like its I sake think, of being there and, and trading, but it's not part of like the actual experience when you it, do bartering. It, just, it, it appeals to a different type of person, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, the, the fun is different. And so the fun is a much deeper in analysis. You know, how do I mm -hmm. analyze all of these wide variety of, of data so that I can make a good decision uh, on this individual one, where it's like this specific item might be undervalued in relation to the market because you have, you know, other information that's saying that. And so I, I'd say it's it's more it's more fun for somebody who is more analytical. Yeah, it's deeper in a way, like mm. strategically thinking. Yeah, but the yeah, act true. itself of trade is less fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, and I think like that there are other parts of gameplay that are um, based on inefficiencies, right? So for example, if you talk about balancing, usually you don't want to have a perfectly balanced game because that mm -hmm. also isn't fun. You And also as you, you alluded to in like the, the board games, you like when people feel like, oh, I have a somewhat overpowered weapon or whatever, they feel the sense of autonomy. So you want to have, give them this feeling and then later you, change the meta, which keeps the game fresh and keeps the tension, right? So there's a lot of things you can apply from other disciplines into game design, because I guess like in the end, everything is a game in, in a way. Yeah, you know, um, there's four kind of pillars of what makes a game a game. Um, and that is having a clear goal, having a feedback system, ideally the faster the better. Number three is having a, a rule set that you play within. And then the fourth one is voluntary action. So if you've got all four of those, you basically have a game. So theoretically, you could think of most things in life as game structures. Um, and I find that to be a, a helpful mental model, um, especially when I'm approaching complex problems with amorphous solutions. I try to think of those, those four things. And with, with that rule set piece, I often try to think of like, what are the limitations, technical limitations um, to implementing something like this? And that 
that helps me come to an answer more quickly. And when you talk about designing rule sets, I feel like video games give you the most control, right? Over the rules. So is that something that excites you? Because you can basically control the physics of the world, right? Mm. When you compare to board games, is that something that you've been thinking about or yeah, is that what, what drove you to video games? You know, it's a, it's a really fascinating concept, the ability to design anything with code. Um, the tricky part is, is because the design space is infinite, <laughs> you know, it's, you have to drill down into things that you already know. And a, a big piece of video games for me has, has always been because it's such a, a risk intensive process, you need to really have a deep understanding of the marketplace and the things that might resonate already, because it doesn't make any sense to make a game that's very random, um, just with so much risk on the line. So if I was a, a solo developer, of course, I can do kind of whatever I wanted and push something out there. And maybe it turns into something like um, Baba is cool, for example, um, or Baba is you, sorry, um, where it's just like a really harebrained idea that turns into something cult classic-y um, or Portal, right? Um, there's, there's a lot of really great games out there that have done some harebrained things and have turned out to be really incredible experiences. So I, I, I wouldn't want to limit but if you're working with a much bigger, um, much higher risk factor, you probably want to stay within the lines and do kind of the process of innovation, which is do the same thing, but tweak one thing differently. And that allows people to look back on the previous thing and be like, oh, it's like this, but it's this. And that's like a very sticky, like mental, mental piece, um, a sticky thought. And that's how people describe so I find that to be a really useful um, tool. Why, why I got into, into video games, though, um, I had always really wanted to be in video games. However, I have been a creative my entire life. And being a creative, I've always wanted to help design from the top level and help design like the, the strategy or the structure. Um, and board games really gave me the opportunity to do, to do that because it was a much smaller team. You cranked out a lot more product in a very short period of time. I probably have made over a thousand games in general across lots of different mediums. Board games specifically, I must have made at least 300. Um, obviously, only 35 went to market. Um, so, you know, you kill a lot of your own ideas. And I, that really helped refine my expertise over time uh, was the ability to work really, really quickly um, in a very large amount, very large quantity, and see a lot of different types. So I worked in preschool games all the way to adult party games. Uh, I did electronic games. Um, I also did social deduction games. Um, I won an award for a social deduction game. I, so we've, we've tried to like pick out specific areas and then design the rule sets around that specific area to create a new experience. And so having had so much experience in all these different types, um, it's allowed me to flexibly think about how to create these different types of experiences, right? Um, and getting into to video games, video games are a much more risk intensive process. There's much larger teams, uh, much more money on the line and much more parallel work as well. So if you make a decision, there's going to, there's going to be a lot more technical debt as a result of that decision. So you need to be very careful about the decisions you make. Um, and it takes a lot more team alignment too. So when coming into video games, I knew I didn't want to go into video games right out of college because I'd be a, a pretty small cog in a big wheel. Um, and I wanted to be more that creative direct, uh, decision director. And I, I honestly thought that the only path to that would be through entrepreneurship. Um, I've always been interested in economics and economic systems like tax systems and things like that. So that naturally appealed to me. Um, and whenever I play video games, I'm always thinking about the in-game economies and monetization and how those things interact. Um, but I didn't think I would be in that field so quickly. Um, that's been a, a really nice, uh, honestly, a surprise to me. Uh, I, I quit the board game job and I tried starting my own company where I was making a Jackbox games competitor. Uh, I was making apps, app games that you play on your phone, um, but they connect to like a TV and you play socially. And it was a combination of like Jackbox games and Mario Party. So a bunch of, you know, simple mini games 
that has um, already hit market in other forms uh, through like internet game, for example. Uh, they're doing the, they're kind of like the the realization of what I was trying to create, but they just executed it way better. Um, and at the time, I didn't really have a lot of cash, so and I didn't have any connections to VC or, or anything like that. None of my friends and family have any have any money, so I couldn't do a friends and family round. I was bootstrapping it my, entirely myself. Uh, ran out of money pretty quickly because digital is expensive, um, and was looking to NFTs as a potential funding source. Um, Axie Infinity was blowing up at the time. I knew that this was kind of like really in my field at this point. So I dove really, really deep into it, built an on-chain game, um, launched it and learned a lot about tokenomics pretty, pretty quickly. Leveraged that experience to jump into tokenomics at Framework. Uh, so I was their in-house tokenomics and governance designer. So I got to work on a bunch of different protocols and games and do a lot of reviews of games, do a lot of DD. So I really got a, a sense for the market and what was working and what wasn't working and why. Um, and I saw a lot of interesting patterns there. So that really led me into having a, a pretty solid meta understanding of where the market is going for Web3. Um, and yeah, I, everything that I saw, I was honestly a little disappointed by. There were a few outliers that were really, really good. But on the whole, I didn't see anything that was really sustainable. So I went on my own to try and design something sustainable. Um, and then ended up at Shima, uh, where I'm working as a venture partner and helping um, their port go with, with tokenomics designs. Yeah, let's talk about that, like the tokenomics and how you approach the token design process. So maybe could you just, yeah, talk about the different steps you take um, along the way, basically, what, what you start with and what you end up with. Yeah, sorry for the uh, the whole monologue here. We're finally getting to the, the meat of the discussion. What you all came to hear, the token design. Uh, how do we, you know, how do we think about a token? Um, and so going back to some of my mental models here, what what is a token in essence? A token is code, right? Like, so you can make it do whatever you want it to do. Um, the second thing a token is, is a, a vehicle, a vehicle for value, right? So if somebody... The only way a token has value is if somebody else purchases the token on the open market or through OTC or some other form to put the value into that token as a result of that exchange, right? And so that's that's what's causing the value to be in a token. Um, it's not, you know, the fundamental demand for the token. Demand is the act of purchasing, right? Like that is what demand is like in the flesh. So, you know, to, to have to... To make a token that has value, you need people to be willing to hold value in that token. And that's a tricky problem because <laughs> essentially you're, you're making something more risky than, say, ETH. And ETH is already relatively risky in you know, the fundamental uh, you know, general world, right? You know, obviously, for us, it's a little bit different. It's probably one of the best investments of a decade uh, or a year. Or, sorry, not a year, a century. Um, at least that's my perspective, but, you know, for most people, it's, it's very risky. Um, and having a, a game token, which is basically a derivative of, uh, a, a, the crypto market, um, that's even further out on the risk curve. So you're asking people to hold value in a riskier asset than you would if you just held ETH, for example. And so when you're designing a token, you need to make sure that the value that somebody's getting is higher than the value of the opportunity cost, which is holding it, say, in ETH. Um, and so when I'm thinking about designing a token, you always have to be considering, okay, how is this going to deliver more value or more exclusive value uh, that you wouldn't be able to get elsewhere? Um, some of that exclusive, exclusive value could come in the form of potential sp price speculation for appreciation. It could come in the value of uh, social value, for example, like you, you have a lot and people respect you for that. Um, it could come in the value of entertainment value where you can use that, uh, that token or that NFT to unlock exclusive experiences that you wouldn't otherwise be able to play. And so, uh, one of the first things that I'm thinking about is, okay, what is going to give this value? Why is this going to be valuable? And why is it going to be more valuable, more attractive than just sitting in ETH? Uh, for example. Um, the second thing that I always 
I'm looking at is what are the emotions that we're trying to evoke here? Um, what is the fun factor? And what is fun about this? And that really comes down to an understanding of the target market. Um, so who are you trying to evoke emotions from? And so you mentioned streamers. That's a really big category because that can help you with UA. Um, is it uh, moms that are short on time that are playing while the kid is in Taekwondo, for example? Or is it guilds that are looking to you know, optimize as much as they can to <laughs> you know, work together or potentially extract from the game? And so it's understanding who that target market is, what they're motivated by, and what they find fun. Um, and that'll help you determine what emotions that you want to try and evoke. So do you have any emotions that you usually see in a lot of games that you can target? Is there like some way of a blueprint, maybe, at least for like certain target groups? Yeah. A lot of it is dependent on the game and the target market. Um, for example, I one of the things that I've looked at in crypto and Web3 game design is what are the main differences from crypto versus some other games? Like you could, if you want a epic world experience, you can go to like Horizon New Dawn, right? Or you can go to Breath of the Wild, um, or you can go Tears of the Kingdom, right? There's, or, you know, Elder Scrolls, like the, the list goes on and on. There's tons and tons of experiences that you can have where you're immersed in a world, right? So what are the differences with Web3? What, what emotions are different there that you can capture? Um, I think risk management is an interesting one. Um, you feel smart when you manage your risk effectively. And that is a real strategic experience. Um, I would say luck mitigation could be another one. Uh, min-maxing is for sure a motivation. Um, there's, there's a lot more. I don't want to give away a lot of the secret sauce. Um, but I would say that those are three good broad categories to start with. Um, and a lot of it really comes down to who you're trying to appeal to. If you're trying to appeal to on-chain gamers, for example, who might not be able to understand, you know, the basics of a smart contract. Maybe you do something like Treaty, where you can make agreements with other people uh, in the game to develop the game. And so, I mean, I think that speaks to UGC as a really killer use case uh, for Web3. Um, it really gives a reason for decentralization as well. And to have a, a group of people that are agreeing that things are good. Like, say, for example, like if you make a, a UGC game, you're naturally going to have a ton of UGC that's really, really bad. Um, and somebody needs to sort through all that. And it can't be the core team because they just don't have the bandwidth. So you need a curation system of sorts. And I think uh, Token uh, gives a really good way to elicit this, um, this curation system. So um, I know there's a bit of a, a roundabout answer there, but I, I would say focus on the emotion that you're trying to appeal to uh, based on the target audience that you're approaching and identify what is unique about that? And don't just make a clone because clones, I don't think they're going to work. Uh, you need to have some innovative piece on it. And just making it Web3 isn't the innovative piece. The innovative piece has to harken back to the different type of emotion that you're going to create in the player um, because of the rule sets that you've set up or the technology that you've set up. Um, technology is the enabler, right? Um, the emotions is what the human experience is all about. Um, or the relationships between people. That's that's really the heart of a game. Um, so you need to understand what that is. Yeah, and I think if, like, when you mentioned risk management and min-maxing, it's a lot of things that have to do with numbers, right? And, like, understanding numbers in a way. Um, so also what I feel like, if you add crypto, you automatically add, like, on-chain games where you say, oh, they are financial games. But also if you have, like, a normal game and just add NFTs, you you still have that financial layer in a way and it changes people's emotions totally right? so yeah as you say like you, you can't just do skins and then these skins are nfts because it kind of changes everything right yeah, yeah. and like you know it, it's interesting because there's a lot of talk about you know finance has taken the game outside of the magic circle but frankly the magic circle was developed as a concept to reflect video games at the time right and yeah, it speaks to flow, et cetera. But there's lots of other things that we might not consider games that are you know, game constructs and some people find fun. So 
you know, I, I think it would be limiting to, to think of these not as games. I think they are games, um, but unfortunately, they are more similar to zero-sum games, and that's just an important distinction to remember. Um, because of the way the value moves into an ecosystem, more people have to hold value in the ecosystem over time. And it's not like... Uh, there's a there's a thought process in crypto games right now that you are creating value um, because you're you're generating more GDP or more spend or whatever. Um, I I tend to disagree with this notion. Um, I don't think you're you're creating value. You're just creating more experience in the game system. If you're creating UGC and you're increasing network value, then yeah, okay, you're I think you're creating value because you're making it more you're making the, the game product more enticing for more people, right? And so that is creating value. Um, what isn't creating value is just, you know, spending tokens to create NFTs. Like that's just transition. Um, that was a bit of a sidebar. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get what you mean. And I mean, if you also, we can quickly cover that, but if you have like a token, convert that into an NFT to later get the same token, it's also like not a sync, right? It's a converter as, as you say. So yeah, it's zero sum. In, in yeah. Like, so at some point it will be zero sum at least. You just extended the inflation and when it becomes actually zero sum, I guess. Um, the, question, the question mark here that you need to answer is no, there needs to be a consumptive activity. And previously the consumptive activity was playing. And if that is no longer the consumptive activity because people can extract value from the experience, what is the consumptive activity? I think it still needs to be entertainment in some form, but it also almost necessarily means that the, the value won't be able to be held in those same assets stable for the long term especially if there's more and more increasing and you don't have an increasing um, demand, aka player base. So I, I think it's interesting that we dubbed an increasing player base Ponzi-nomics, and the only way a, a crypto game can work is with larger player bases. I mean, this is fundamental to business. Like if a business wants to grow, you need more customers, or you need to make the product cheaper, or you need to make the business more efficient, right? Or you need to go into a different market. Those are really some of the only ways to to increase market share as a business. So I don't necessarily think having a requirement for having more players for the game to be more successful is is a bad thing. I think that's probably logical. Um, so I think our addiction to the term Ponzi-nomic is, is hampering us um, because you ultimately need lots of people to be ever increasingly more engaged. But you also need a way to decrease the amount of assets or token in the ecosystem in periods of falling demand. And so that'll require a, an algorithmic way to decrease it based on whatever that falling demand rate is, uh, especially if you have a way to increase it based on increased demand. So I, I think that's an important piece to think about. Yeah, and I think like, I mean, the way I always understood the issues or what people talked about like Ponzinomics is that like the demand from new players shouldn't be the only demand in the ecosystem right so mm. because it's also unfair to new players in a way if they are the only ones that have to buy into the game basically and the other people can just have like an uncapped ROI on, on their assets basically and don't have something totally. like a repair system or a health system or whatever that acts as a sink and yeah can kind of like redistribute tokens within the economy, something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the end, also when you look at economies, a lot of economies also grow because their population is growing, right? So you need new people. Of course, there's technological like advances, but a lot sure. of it is also just, yeah. Yeah, that and exports. Population growing. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think we're going to be able to replicate the exports piece because every game has its own incentive to make its own NFTs. Like, you don't really yeah. have a major incentive to integrate somebody else's NFTs unless you're trying to get their community. Um, but even then, yeah, it's, it's still more end, beneficial yeah. to say, like, do a vampire attack. Say, like, hey, bring over your item from this, burn it here, and transform it into our own native item. Like, that would be the most effective solution. So this whole interoperability thing is, um, I don't know, I think it's a bit of a pipe dream because the incentives just aren't aligned. 
for the developers mm. who are making big risks to, to bring these to market. Um, there's probably going to be some that work that say everything can be interoperable because that's their entire business model. Um, I think that can that can function properly. But I think for the most part, most games are going to try and make their own NFTs. Yeah, I guess if you make it like your business model, that it's like a big IP of everything and everything right. works together. Yeah. Yeah, th th then it works. But if you build like a game and that's what you do, then yeah, it's mostly UA. Yeah. Yep. Um, so let's talk a bit more about uh, the process. You mentioned emotions. So what kind of emotions do I want to create? Like how are you going afterwards? Like what, what's... What are the next steps, basically? Yeah, so when I work with uh, a company, I follow a pretty standard process. Number one is I talk to the team and I identify what exactly their goals are for the project. Because if the team is not motivated to work on the project, if they're not excited to work on the project, then the project is toast. So you need to really have a deep understanding of what the team is trying to achieve and what their vision is um, so that you can match what that is long term. Because um, the, the worst situation would be to work on something, make it really pretty, and then no one's excited to work on it, right? That would be the, the worst possible result. Um, so team alignment is key. Uh, then you focus on um, the emotion that you're trying to evoke based on what the team goals are and based on the target audience for that. And maybe the target audience shifts based on the team goals, right? And so you realize through development with the team that your target audience might not be exactly who you thought it was. And it's like, oh, this might actually appeal to a different set. And as a result, we're going to try and target different emotions, for example. Then I focus on structural limitations, which is what is that technology actually capable of? And how fast can we do it? How large is the team? How big is the budget? Where are we going to get UA? Can we find a way to get UA as part of the game design itself, right? So can we design the game for really big moments that streamers would be excited about so that you can get UA for much cheaper, right? Because that's part of the game experience. Then you look at team capabilities, like what is the team able to achieve from like a cosmetics or live ops standpoint? And then I get into where does demand for the token come from? Like what is the value of the token, the fundamental value? Um, is it entertainment value? Is it social value? Is it financial value? Speculative value? Lots of different types of value. And then how do we retain that value inside the token? And that's all part of the, the thought process there. And then finally, we get to game integration. So once you know all of those previous things, that's when I really get into how do you weave this token in into the game effectively so that the token isn't exploitable and, you know, One of the difficult things about putting a token into a game is if somebody's able to earn it in its fully liquid form, uh, they're able to extract it immediately. And the only reason they would want to keep it in the game is for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, speculative value with the belief that it might go higher. Number two, usage of the token to increase your um, powers, for example, uh, which theoretically you'd only use it if you get more rewards as a result of that. Um, I think there's an opportunity in that piece to play with risk. Or number three, the entertainment value is worth it, right? Um, and it's interesting because we already solved that third one in Web 2. And is the entertainment value worth it? Well, that's how we have monetization right now. Um, and it's a one-way street. And so when you make it a two-way street, when you make tokens extractable, I don't think you can rely entirely on the entertainment value. I think you need to rely on the fact that you might not be able to sell it immediately. Um, that might be a piece of the answer because you need value to be held in a token for a long time. And being held means not sold um, and also not spent. Because if you immediately spend a token, well, it's still not really being held. You can burn it, I guess, in which case the token is no longer in existence, in which case the, the value is transferred to the rest of the token holders equivocally um, or equally. Um, so I, there's, there's a lot of ways to think about that, but I, I would say the, the process for thinking about it is, is that, that those steps. And when you talk about like, giving some barriers to exit essentially like mm. are you for example we can also go back to to what we talked about earlier 
like a token is probably way easier to sell than maybe an NFT, right? So are you thinking about, okay, token doesn't necessarily have to be like a fungible token, but also an NFT may be like better in this regard. Or are you thinking about like just exit delays or exit taxes, for example? Like, yeah, what are potential solutions basically? Yeah. Um, because all of this is code, you can do anything, right? And so I wouldn't constrain yourself to thinking in one way. One way could be time. Another way could be skill, right? You can only exit if you reach a certain skill level. Or you can only exit if you reach a certain skill level um, within a certain time period, for example. Um, and then you can extract whatever you got in that one battle if you reach that certain level. Um, I think you need a blend of reputation plus skill. So um, you can only extract larger amounts once your skill level and your reputation is that high. And because you have a reputation that is account bound, um, you can't go below and play below that skill level because like, here's, here's the problem with real money gaming. Like, and this is evident in poker, for example, you're always going to want to play just below the level that you're actually at, because that's the level that you can consistently win. Um, obviously, if you play at a higher level, you might have higher rewards, um, but you don't want to risk that much. You don't want to lose that much. And that, that same effect is in Web3 games. Like if there is a way to consistently beat the same levels over and over again and get rewards from it, um, you'll play just below your skill level because you know you're going to consistently win. Um, which is the most profitable method, right? It's not as risky. What we need to do as game designers is force players to play at the next highest level. <laughs> and the best way to do that is to have reputation uh, that are account bound. Um, yeah. Does that, uh, does that shed some light? Yeah. And I think like maybe we can talk a little bit about that. If you have like account bound reputation, like how... Would it look in like the real world? Can you provide an example of that? Yeah, um, the easiest example I would say is like you've got a leaderboard, right? And the top of the leaderboard gets the most rewards. It's full PvP, um, and theoretically, it's always best to play just below your true experience level so that you will consistently win. Because if you are risking a lot just to get one more level up on the leaderboard. I, let's not use leaderboard, let's use tiers. So you've got different tiers that you're playing in and it's better to stay in a tier below because you're able to earn more, even though one tier above, you could be earning a higher quantity, but you might win less, right? Uh, less frequently. Um, so in some, it's better to be right below your skill level, right? So Having an account bound reputation means once you break into the higher tier, you're stuck there. You can't go back down. Um, granted, there's always ways to hack that in the form of starting a new account and then playing all the way up. But I think the solution to that is making the path to earning a long period of time. So you won't be able to earn for like, say, the first six months of that account being live. Um, or you'll earn in very small amounts, for example, until you get to the point where you're you're high enough. So the opportunity cost for you to restart is higher than the risk you'd be taking to play in this higher tier. And that's that's more of the equation. Okay, that, that makes it clear. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think like one, one other point we can go more into is we already covered like the barriers to exit. Is there like other challenges and solutions that you see that generally work across a lot of games and like their token economies? Mm. Yeah. One thing that I want to call out is that if you are rewarding an action in a game with value, could be tokens, could be NFTs, and that value in that action could be repeated in mass, for example, the value of that reward will fall to the level of difficulty of that action. And if that action, say, is relatively easy or repeatable, then the fundamental value of that action approaches zero in the long run. 
And I think that's an important thing to consider with crypto games is if you're creating an action that is giving, say, token value, but that action is easily repeatable by a lot of people, then the value of that action falls towards zero, which means your token is going towards zero. And so, yeah, I don't necessarily have a, a point beyond that that definition. I think that's an important thing to think about. Something you mentioned previously about tokens and NFTs, though, um, tokens, because they are extremely liquid, you can sell them into an AMM without a buyer. And I think that's an important piece to consider. And it's a, important distinction between tokens and NFTs is with NFTs, you need a buyer on the other side. And so NFTs are a lot more illiquid um, and therefore better at holding value, retaining value over time for the game and game ecosystem. So I'm like, I'm a bit more partial to NFTs uh, than tokens. Obviously, I think tokens have their place and their purpose. Um, But NFTs, in essence, are better at retaining value because they are harder to leave from. Um, when something is super liquid, say a token, the only thing that's keeping them there is either the entertainment value or the desire to, you know, upgrade more so that you can get more value from it. And to make that truly sustainable, you need a level of risk there. Um, whereas NFTs, it's a little bit interesting because you can deprecate them over time. Uh, you can have new seasons of say cosmetics that are the, the new hot item Whereas the previous ones, well, they might lose value, right? Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's something important to, to consider. Like, should all NFTs have value? Should everything be an NFT? Should you constrain the supply of NFTs on purpose and allow the market to decide, you know, what's going to be an NFT? And the perfect example of this um, was with uh, Shrapnel. And I think there's a lot of other games that are going to be doing it as well with like NFT foils, where you release a certain number of NFT foils and you let the market decide what should be an NFT or not. Um, Because you can take an NFT item, you can decraft it, uh, break it into its component parts, get the NFT foil, which is in limited supply, and then put that on top of another item to make that new item the NFT. So you're essentially allowing the market to determine what should be an NFT and what should not be an NFT. And of course, you can have a burn on either side of that equation, whatever, doesn't really matter. Like that's the process is uh, of allowing the market to determine what should be an NFT. That's the important piece. Um, And so that really goes back to, you know, supply of NFTs and what gives it value, what causes value to be held in there in the first place. Um, And what emotion are you trying to evoke with that? Like, right. If you're trying to say that certain NFTs or like NFTs in general might be more valuable than their account bound counterparts, um, what emotion is that evoking? Is that um, exclusivity, right? The feeling of exclusivity, feeling that you are more powerful, um, right? Like that's that, that's what you got to get to is asking those questions. Got it. Yeah, so really like thinking from first principles, basically, right? like starting with emotions and then actions and then building the economic, economic system basically around it. Um, and mm-hmm. yeah, having incentives, disincentives as well. Um, because like when we talk about player behavior, a lot of it is also, I mean, we have all these individuals and they come together in the economy, right? So with it, we can create something that is like net positive. Also in a way we talked a lot about being zero sum, but as you mentioned, like before with token curated registries, for example, if you have a lot of UGC. And you need to curate that. I mean, when you incentivize people to do that, it's also a better experience for, um, yeah, the people playing the game, right? Because they get access to the right skins or game modes or whatever. Um, but I think also like, not just like the first part is definitely thinking about the, the individual player, but there's like, in the end, it all comes together in like a macro economy, basically, right? Where you have like, positive externalities, negative externalities, and they all are related to each other, like, right? Like every entity interacts with another entity in the end. Um, yeah, so I guess yeah, like, it's, it's important to understand what those those people's goals are, right? What are those entities' yeah, exactly. goals, right? And if everybody's yeah. entity's goal is to make more money, right? 
like you need to understand that money doesn't come from nowhere. Like it's coming from somewhere. Um, because at the end of the day, tokens are a vehicle, right? You're not imbuing the token with value. Like it's just, think of it like, um, you've got a giant pool of water, all right? Like a swimming pool, right? And that is the liquidity of the crypto ecosystem, right? If you want your game, which is a cup, to get water from that pool, you need to take water from that pool, right? And that's how value really moves around the crypto ecosystem. It's just like lots of distributing you know, between these different cups, right? Cups and buckets and whatever. And the only time more value comes in is when it rains, right? And that's when more fiat money comes into crypto, right? And that's more value coming into the ecosystem. That's what's causing the, the inflation of value. Um, and so if you want to bring more value into your game, uh, and I'm talking like crypto value, for example, um, you need to take it from somewhere. Where is it? Where's it coming from? Yeah, and I think like one of the problems that crypto has is often that people don't see that you have this limited pool of value because of paper gains, right? Because like mm. with paper gains, it can kind of feel like, oh, there's much more value here now, but to actually like realize the value will show you that no, there's no like new value actually there. It's just imaginary value, a lot of it, mm. right? Um, yeah. But it always comes back to like, what are we trying to achieve with this game, right? Like what what is the emotional experience we're trying to unlock here? And don't get me wrong, I, I certainly see the value of lower UA costs because you're paying players directly rather than paying, say, advertisers. Um, however, I don't think the paying advertisers is ever going to go away. Um, but there's certainly uh, an appeal to paying players directly because it makes them more excited, more engaged, etc. But if you play, pay, if you pay players in tokens, um, and then they go sell the token, well, then you're getting hit double. It would have been better if you just gave them dollars in the first place, because if you give them a token and then they sell your token, you know they're running away with the dollars, and your token price gets hurt, right? So it's it's an interesting um, paradox to be thinking of. Like most people think, oh, if I give somebody tokens, I'm giving them free money, right? Like because I invented these tokens out of thin air. But you got to remember that these tokens are really a parking spot, right? It's a parking spot for value. Um, and if you reduce the amount of parking spots, well, then each parking spot becomes a little bit more valuable, especially if there's a lot of cars that demand the parking spots, right? Um, so uh, I wouldn't think of tokens as free money. I would think of it as just a, a vehicle, a vehicle for value. Um, and when you start thinking of it that way, you start realizing, ah, oh, there's there's different ways to be considering token design, um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, people need to feel comfortable holding value in that token more than if they held, say, ETH, um, and that's a really difficult equation to figure out. And one of the things that helps with that is what we alluded to before: is that barrier to exit. Um, a lot of games already do this. Uh, say Roblox, for example. They take a, a very large cut when you try to extract Robux. Um, and a lot of people think it's very predatory. Um, however, when you look at the economics of it, they kind of have to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know where we end up with Web3 games. I, I highly doubt we're going to be fully open for a lot longer um, just because of the, the issues with that. And frankly, most, most games don't have longer than a two-year lifespan. So you're going to get a really big spike in the beginning and then interest will die off. And if interest dies off, do people still hold the token? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and we've got a bunch of people trying to build these forever games. Um, I don't know. I don't know how long those last. There's only a few games that make it past 10 years. There's, there's not that many. Uh, they're hard to come by. There will be a crypto game that does it and they're going to write stories about it. And, wax poetic about it, but there's thousands of games that launch every single year. Um, and so if we're trying to make something that's truly sustainable, I think you need to think about it a little bit differently. Um, limited time things are valuable, for example, things with historical value, for example, stuff that 
can retain value because it holds value for the people that are involved in it. That's what will help break it through. Uh, we, we covered a lot of ground today. So I think for the audience, it's also interesting to know like how how can I become like a token designer and think about the stuff like, yeah, where yeah. to start basically. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to become a token designer, um, there's a few fundamental things that you need to do. Um, first thing is you need to understand what tokens are at a very fundamental level. Um, and that will require you to go very deep into DeFi. Um, just understanding what tokens are and why they are the way they are. Um, look into the code. Look into what is a token, like at its most basic level. It is code, right? You can design it to do a lot of different things. And so you need to understand the parameters of, say, the Ethereum ecosystem. So like, what can Ethereum do? Or what can Avalanche do? Or what can Polygon do? Um, and something that helps with that is reading a lot of white papers. Um, so I would say, read as many white papers as you can. And this is free. This is free information. Just go super, super deep on that. And try to try to piece it together in your own head first. You know, create hypotheses and then try to break those hypotheses. Look around the market for, you know, does this token exist? Um, ask other people, you know, start building your network a little bit. Find a group of people that are also interested in this sort of thing and start asking them questions. Start getting resources from them. What are they looking at? Um, a lot of it is because this, because this space is so amorphous still and there's not a ton of best practices, it helps to think from first principles and get as much information as you can. Um, at least that's been my process. Uh, of course, everybody's colored by their own bias and processes. Um, that's the process that I followed. I went super, super deep. And when I was first um, going deep into crypto games, I studied four or five hours a day, every single day for six months straight. Um, and I, I used as many resources as I could. I looked at a ton of different articles. I read lots of white papers. Um, I've probably read over a thousand white papers at this point. Um, you just, you have to intake a lot of information and start looking at the patterns. Um, the next thing that's super helpful, if you're going to do tokenomics for games, uh, it helps to play games. Like that is, <laughs> that's surprising, but uh, not a lot of people play games um, that are working professionally. Like a lot of people don't have time, but if you want to be really, really good, you got to play games a lot. Um, so I play a very wide variety of games. I play at least an hour of video games a day um, across a pretty wide spectrum. I'm currently playing a VR game uh, called Swarm. Uh, super fun. I'm playing, a, I'm playing a lot of Marvel Snap. I used to play a lot of Mario Kart. played a lot of Zelda. Uh, played Call of Duty. I played MOBAs. You know, I played everything under the sun, really, especially if it's something that I'm working on. Like if I'm working on a, a project or a game, I'm checking out the competitors. I'm seeing what they're doing well and how their monetization systems work. Um, and I'm thinking about like, why does it work? Why did they make the decisions that they made? Um, and are there like comparatives in other games um, that, that could work? Like what's the best format of a battle pass? Well, depends on the, the game type. Um, so if you want to be a good game tokenomist, I would recommend playing games. That helps. Um, and also having an understanding of, you know, where monetization has gone and why. So about every 10 years, the video game industry goes through a, a pretty massive monetization shift. I believe we're going through another one right now. Um, it's driven by three fundamental things. So <clears throat> as much as we say crypto needs games, games really also needs crypto because the free-to-play model is, is kind of breaking. Um, and this is happening for, for three reasons. Number one, um, a lot of the data is being scooped up by the, the largest players and the smaller ones, the smaller players can't really access anymore, especially because of the ad attribution changes with Apple. And Google's gonna be releasing that in a couple months. Um, so everything that we've relied on for free to play uh, to bring UA costs down and to really target specific users with ads and programmatic ads, uh, we're losing that. Um, so you're seeing a lot of people shifting towards PC as a result to combat that. And Web3 presents an opportunity because all this data is public and wallet information is public. You can target specific users again. Um, so I think that might be an answer to that. Um, the second reason things are changing is because interest rates are rising. Um, in the previous decade, 
a lot of growth in the free-to-play industry was fueled by low interest rate loans. Um, companies will take out a, a like a one-year loan, for example, um, buy a bunch of ads uh, because they know their cost per acquisition and they know their lifetime value, but the lifetime value is over the course of a year. But they're comfortable making that that decision because they know that that equation is positive. Um, but a lot of these games are running on very slim percentage margins uh, on this equation. So because interest rates have risen, um, you're getting a situation where these profits no longer make sense. So is there a way to increase the LTV of the customer or decrease the UA costs? Um, and how do you do that when you're in a situation with rising interest rates? Um, and so that's part of the calculus as well. Um, and I'm honestly, I'm forgetting the third piece right now. I have it written down somewhere, um, but it's not top of mind right now. Yeah, no, no problem. Like the second one, I actually wasn't aware of. I, I didn't know that they had these short-term loans just for UA. Um, yeah, Gabe, yeah. Gabe Layden, baby. That's, uh, <laughs> that's his playbook. Um, oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's a couple other, uh, big companies that, that do the exact same thing. Um, yeah, it's most, most okay. of how a free to play runs, um, yeah. <laughs> because you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get the whales. Um, yeah, but yeah, again, course. this equation is shifting. If you can increase the amount of people who are willing to put money into the game and hold money in the game, uh, you're increasing the lifetime value of the customers, right? And if you're able to retain customers uh, in a better way or get lower UA costs, for example, you could increase your margins. Um, and I think crypto and Web3 presents an opportunity for that. And so as much as Web3 needs crypt or Web3 needs games to keep growing that, that rain into the pool, if you will, um, games really do need Web3 and crypto as well. Um, yeah. It's just finding out how to make that marriage work. We need we need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the one thing I've been thinking about is is crypto more there to like have more paying users? Is it to better monetize the existing whales, or is it more on the UA side? And I guess we will see over time. It's probably all of them, depending on how you how you do it. Um, but yeah, we will see like how, how all of that works out. Um, you know. I think there's a lot of benefits to, to crypto and Web3 just in general. Um, obviously, you get a lot of efficiency in, in savings um, because the the platforms are super streamlined. Um, it uses a lot less energy. Uh, it's open, so you don't have any borders with that. So you instantly appeal to a global audience. So there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to this, and I think you know crypto eventually dominates the the financial landscape. Um, because of these factors, because it's just so much faster and, and it's secure. Um, and you can cut out a lot of middlemen and third parties. So in terms of a payment rail, it's super, super effective. And frankly, lots of games and products and services, digital services, they'll all need payment rails. So um, in terms of bringing on adoption, I think it's going to happen regardless. It's just a matter of where is it going to come from. I personally think it's going to come from games because... You can design a game to be, um, you, you can put blockchain in the background, for example, and people won't even know they're interacting with blockchain, but they're buying virtual goods and services and gamers are already used to doing that. So I think that thesis is correct, that games will probably be the first avenue for adoption. Um, I think this permeates though, obviously, I mean, I wouldn't be working in the space if I didn't believe that. So. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I mean, same for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Marvel Snap. I just wanted to say that they have a great GDC video on like their game design and how they thought about it. So for for everyone in the audience, you should check that out if you're interested. And you actually forgot one good resource, which is your Twitter account. So now I give you time to shill all your links or whatever you want to shill. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, frankly, I, I haven't been partial to social media uh, in my life. It's not something that I've really focused on, so I don't use it very often. But you can uh, you can follow me at Metzler Games if you'd like. M E T Z L E R Games. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm much more active on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I have most of my connections. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't post very much publicly. Uh, I do this because I'm working with so many companies that a lot of my stuff is proprietary. So I have to watch what I say publicly. Um, but I'm really hoping to start sharing a lot more once um, once some of these games hit market. Um, then I'll be able to talk a lot more. That sounds like a seven, second episode. <laughs> we yeah. have to we'll do a part two. Point. Yeah, yeah. If, you know, if there's demand for it, you know, if nobody nobody cares about this one, yeah. Yeah. oh well. And I will make people watch. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for that's it. For, <laughs> uh, that's it for this time. I think we covered a lot of ground. So thank you for jumping on um, and answering my questions. Yeah, for um, sure. I hope yeah. this was uh, valuable for the listeners as well. Uh, I know we took a very much a shotgun approach, and sometimes I went in the meandering way, but. Uh, You're talking, That's to, good. I You're like talking that. to an artist. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. See you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Deus Ex Dao podcast, a place where some of the most progressive and innovative builders, thought leaders, and traders in the crypto space come together to discuss all areas of the crypto industry. Whether you're into DeFi, Layer 1s, Layer 2s, NFTs, or anything in between, we've got you covered. And as a reminder, nothing said on this podcast should be construed as financial advice or as a solicitation to buy or sell any digital asset or security. The comments, views, and opinions expressed by the hosts or guests on the podcast are their own. As always, you'll need to do your own research. <laughs>